Good afternoon. I'm Molly Young from the Miami University Alumni Association. As part of the Miami University Alumni Association's webinar series, today we present Miami in World War II, the Carl Lavin story, brought to you in partnership with the Walter Havikhurst Special Collections and University Archives and Hillel at Miami University. Our guest today is Ambassador Frank Lavin. Frank served on the White House and National Security Council staff, as well as service as the United States Ambassador to Singapore and Undersecretary of Commerce for International Trade. Frank currently helps U.S. brands sell into China via e-commerce. Welcome to Ambassador Frank Lavin, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Questions were collected, <clears throat> excuse me, during registration and the ambassador will address some of those throughout the webinar today. Our viewers will also have the option to ask questions during the webinar by clicking ask a question on the bottom of your screen. Please know that in the interest of time we have available, we may not get to every question. Today's webinar will last about an hour, including time for those questions and answers. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Frank to tell us a really great story. Welcome, Frank. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Molly. It's great to be here. Uh, delighted to have the chance to chat with you, chat with everyone. Uh, I wish I wish we could meet on campus. Uh, but in some respects, this has a huge advantage because there's somewhat of a national and I believe even an international audience today of Miami friends and grads and history buffs and other interested parties from all around the country. So uh, so sometimes uh, these webinar formats uh, actually are a little better than than meeting a purpose. But thank, I want to thank you and I also want to thank the library and the special collection and uh, Miami uh, Hillel who helped put together this, this stem from an exhibit that was on campus which uh, I was delighted to help support, uh, but but it, COVID meant that I couldn't personally visit. Uh, so it's a little bit of, uh, you know, it was a nice, very nice step, but a little bit uh, 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 of, a, of a hollow victory, so to speak, because uh, I, I couldn't be there in person. But this, this, is, this might even be better off. Uh, and look, this is a discussion. We're going to talk about World War II and Miami as seen through one uh, soldier's journey uh, through Carl Lavin, but it's 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 a somewhat of a universal story. I think is one of the central messages that the whole campus went to war, if you may say that. And uh, in the course of World War II, there are something like five thousand Miami students and grads serving in uniform, beyond folks who served in civilian capacity or supported the war effort back home. So it was a national mobilization and Miami was a big uh, part of that. What, what I'd like to do in this talk is uh, start in Europe and set the stage for what we were trying to do and then come back to Miami and the U.S. and how we how we got uh, to that European uh, point. Uh, because the, the war for America, the war in Europe on mainland Europe only lasted about a year from D-Day in uh, June of 1944 to uh, Hitler's surrender, Germany surrender in May of 1945. So it was about 12 months of combat on the continent. Uh, that, that discounts what's going on in Asia, that discounts all the whole North Africa campaign against Rommel, and that discounts the very uh, vital battle of the North Atlantic. Uh, that we had to prevail on a battle North Atlantic in order to get to Europe. But the European theater itself was one year of combat, more or less. And the most intense moment of that one year of combat was the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, and this took place in December 44 to January 45, about halfway through that one year period. But uh, let me walk you through why this is important, why it's sort of central to this story and central to the American experience. This was the first time since D-Day, six months earlier, this is the first time that the U.S. was not on the offensive, that Hitler was on the offensive, that, that Nazi Germany was calling the shots. And indeed, it was the rapid U.S. advance across France and to, across the Belgian borders to the German border through the summer, fall, and beginning of winter 1944 that was part of the problem. 
because it meant that U.S. supply lines were stretched very thin and it meant U.S. forces at the front were stretched very thin. And it also meant Hitler was playing on home territory. His supply lines were dramatically improved and his ability to sum up, summon and mobilize and move people where he needed them was, was greatly improved. So Hitler could launch his offensive in December 44 by throwing 200,000 troops against 100,000 GIs manning that Belgian border with Germany. Uh, and Hitler's plan was pretty brazen. I mean, very similar to what he did four years ago. Four years ago, he had thrown the Wehrmacht against France and it fell in uh, six weeks, right? So he said, we can do this again. He saw it uh, in 1940, and he saw it in uh, 1939, 1940, and he saw it in uh, uh, World War One, where Germany tried to do it and failed. So he's seen it twice before, one success, one unsuccessful. He said, I'm going to do it this third time. We smash through the U.S. lines. We fight all the way to the coast. We shut down Antwerp, which is the largest port serving the Allies at that time. We split the Western Front in two. I can do it, right? So a very brazen plan, uh, and it worked. It worked for a few weeks. It worked initially. Uh, Hitler was able to drive miles and miles and miles into that recently liberated territory. All the territory U.S. had fought for in the previous months was they were, we were now being pushed out of, and it took several weeks for the United States to stabilize that front. Uh, so Hitler created a bulge, hence the common name, the formal name is the Battle of the Ardennes. We all know it as the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, and the U.S. was only able to stabilize that front by drawing troops from across Europe. Uh, I mentioned we started that battle with about 100,000 troops and Hitler had 200,000. We ended up that battle with 600,000 GIs in combat and 400,000 support troops. So 1 million GIs, and there were only in the entire world, there were only 8 million Americans in uniform, including Asia and Pacific. So one eighth of the entire US force structure of World War II was thrown into this one battle. So the Battle of the Bulge was and remains the largest battle ever fought by the United States. And not surprisingly, when you get that degree of magnitude, the scale of casualties also becomes significant. Of that 1 million uh, GI, 600,000 in combat, there were 100,000 casualties, 100,000 killed or injured. This was approximately one tenth of all U.S. combat casualties for all of World War II, just in this six week period. So Miami student Carl Lavin, who forms the sort of narrative of the story, was in England when, it, when the battle broke out on December 16th. And it was Christmas Day, nine days later, that he and the other riflemen of his division were stripped out and sent to the front. So Christmas lunch in the mess hall, a special Christmas celebration, and uh, then they're told to report to barracks, have their barrack bags ready, truck is coming in 15 minutes, and you're going to cross the channel, and you're going to the front. Uh, but that's how the U.S., replaced units, unlike unlike uh, every other uh, military uh, combatant in World War II, uh, U.S. replaced individual losses with individual replacements. Every other nation took units, depleted units offline and replaced an entire unit. So you had unit cohesion and it was a little easier uh, to do it, but the U.S. did not do it that way. But now let me go back. So I've set the stage about what what we're talking about here. Let me go back a few years at, at a few miles, so we hear the, the Miami side of this uh, story. Uh, the story actually begins a little bit north of Miami because Carl was born and raised in Canton, Ohio with his family, mom and dad, one older brother, Fred, uh, two years older, which is important because he also went to Miami. And But Carl was a high school senior 
1941 when Pearl Harbor was attacked and the U.S. entered the war. And of course, the most common response of the high school seniors after Pearl Harbor was attacked was it's several months until we graduate, several months until we turn 18, we're not going to have the chance to fight. The war is going to be over by the time we get through this, we're ready to sign up. Right? So uh, he did graduate that spring of 42. He turned 18 that April and he enlisted, but he's told at the time of enlistment, uh, you're not going to be called up now. The U.S. is going through mobilization. We're still in the first few months after Pearl Harbor, so it's going to take a while to ramp up. So go ahead and start at Miami in the fall of 42. Now, just to give you some context, the United States military went from pre-Pearl Harbor numbers of under 200,000 to within two years to over 2 million, as I mentioned, by 1944, 8 million. But that ramp up is a sequential process where you've got to train the trainers and you've got to build the barracks and the campgrounds and you've got to, you, you can only put so many people through it once. It could take you a good year or two. It said it took two years to go up from 200,000 to 2 million. To give you a frame of reference for that under 200,000 where the U.S. was in peacetime uh, uh, pre-Pearl Harbor moment, the New York Police Department today has a personnel of about 75,000. So the U.S. Army in 1940-41 was a little bit more than twice the size, not quite three times the size of NYPD. Right? So Carl enters Miami in the fall of 42. He is a business major. He is a business major, we believe, in large part because his parents uh, agreed to allow him to go to school uh, on the condition that he be a business major. So you can tell there was some skepticism or res some reservations about uh, going to college, but luckily for him, they supported him and he was able to go and it helped change his life and certainly prepared him for the combat that was ahead. The, the one, the campus life in the fall of 42 is still very much peacetime campus life from what we can tell. We're, again, we're, we're about eight or nine or 10 months into the war but it has dramatically changed things. The one change is there's a ROTC type presence on campus called the Enlisted Reserve Corps in which Carl participates in. So it means like ROTC today, it means some lectures, it means a uniform, it means regular drills, uh, but it's not, it's not meaningfully different than what you might see during peacetime. And I could read to you uh, some letters home that might give you a sense of a, uh, young man or a teenager uh, talking to his mom, his first time ever living away from home and quite proud of uh, what he's doing uh, at Miami. So this is, I'm just going to read this uh, text uh, from November 30th, 1942. Dear mom, it's probably a good thing I didn't write you last week. I spent all my time studying for the nine week exams. Well, sounds good anyway. With these results, business, incomplete, missed the test and took it later, but I don't migrate yet. I believe it was an A. Math, A. Geology, A. English, A. And history, A. Honest, it was three times as much a surprise to me as it was, uh, as it is now to you. The very worst I can have is a 3.8 average, and it's probably 4.0. Well, B, I don't uh, but don't go expecting it every time. I was just darn lucky. By the way, my roommate is now about three food shipments up on me. Why don't you send some more down before Xmas vacation? It's cold enough for orange juice to keep, and we could use some more cheese and some meat and some dates and some fudge, most of all. Also, anything else you can think of would be greatly appreciated. Love, Carl. P.S. Any big dances going on this Xmas? So that that sums up a lot of his communications uh, to home. Uh, the only thing that's missing from this letter, which shows up pretty routinely in other letters, is request for money. Uh, but it's, a, it, it's in many respects a very normal set of communications that were in the fall of 1942. That changes over Christmas break. It changes dramatically. And I have to say it since 
since we went on for a minute or so of bragging about grades and he did end up with a 4.0 that first semester grades completely fall apart second semester he ends up not he doesn't fail any courses but he ends up with c's and d's which prompted my question to my dad well how could how could matters fall apart so quickly and he said well as you get into january and february everybody's being called up everybody's being mobilized and you know it's only a matter of time so campus changes from being this glorious center of higher education and lifting people up and helping people think seriously about the world and where they're going it changes from that kind of environment to just a waiting room and he said honestly all we did all spring semester was play poker that's all we did and guys getting called up and go and this is no sense even going to classes uh and we know we're we're going to be sent in and we know uh that it's going to be pretty bloody remember what else takes place toward the end of the fall semester U.S. goes into North Africa. The first U.S. combat troops and the first casualties start coming in November, December 1942. So the mood of the war changes from just the initial ebullience to the hard reality that this is going to be a slog. This is going to be a fight, right? So, uh, so Carl is mobilized in May 1943. He's activated and he's sent off to basic training in Texas, Camp Hood. And I'll read uh, another note, this from June, 1943. Dear folks, here's what we did yesterday. Got up at 0500, 5 a.m. to you, which was not too unusual since we've been doing it every single day. Reveille at 515 to 525, Chow at 530 to about 550, then, Try to get washed, make your bed, clean out your barracks, prepare for inspection, put on your leggings, fill your canteen. The water is no good here. It has to be medicated. And police the area in about 45 minutes. Then we march off to the training area with pack and guns, either a 1917 model Enfield or a Thompson submachine gun. From 0700 to 1100, we have classes of 50 minutes each, separated by two minute wind sprint, an eight minute rest period. The classes are on first aid and gas mostly so far, but we'll be having many more different ones. We just started motor maintenance and driving, but we've also had military courtesy, the articles of war. I can be put up for life for not shining my shoes. Article of War 94, conduct, I'm becoming a soldier. And we have map reading. Then there is an hour of drill and formation exercising. From 1200 to 1330, we eat and have a rest period, most of which is taken up in waiting in line to get some food, waiting in line to get seconds, and waiting in line to wash your mess gear. To 1730, we have some more classes sometimes. Usually, the last hour spent in doing something a little more exerting. Like yesterday, we had a hike. I believe I wrote before saying how hard it was marching three miles in 50 minutes with a pack in 85 degree heat. Well, yesterday we marched five miles in 45 minutes with a pack and a rifle in 90 degree heat. Those marches are really the only thing that I don't like about the army. And I have a violent hatred of them. They are nothing but torture from the first step to the last. And there is no deeper discouragement than to have your leg muscles panning, uh, painting and your shoulders rub sore and you come to some rough or sandy ground and you realize you still have four more miles to go, but can do absolutely nothing but continue to march and march at top speed. Then toward the end of your uh, end, your eyes start to smart from the sweat washing through them. And you hope you won't stumble because you're sure you won't be able to start up again. But the funny thing is, once you're back and you put down your pack and gun, the relief takes all the tiredness away and you don't throw yourself down in your bunk as you so ardently desired on a hike. You lay down for two or three minutes, drink a quart and a half of water usually, and start joking about the hike. So to finish uh, basic training, Carl gets through basic training. He is originally a uh, in the tank destroyers, TDs. He's, uh, he's after different training assignments in the US, including a, a college assignment in New York City. He's sent to the 69th Division, which is training in 
uh, uh, Camp Shelby in Mississippi, and he's a, he's trained as a barman. Bar meaning Browning automatic rifle. Each squad has one barman. It is a uh, heavy uh, machine gun, a one-person machine gun uh, that infantry squads carry. Uh, and the unit is shipped off. The 69th is shipped off to uh, Britain uh, several months after D-Day, and the division is held in reserves. As I mentioned before, the division is held in reserves, uh, but the 69th has the distinction of being the division in the United States Army that is most depleted, most stripped of individuals to go fill other divisions. So it, it maintains its reserve status for most of the war, but it's a source for people being sent to the front from other, uh, uh, to, to fill holes in the line, which is what happens to Carl on Christmas day. Uh, let me, let me uh, give you one other uh, story, if I may, from the, from uh, the book. And uh, this, this takes place from some history research and some first person discussions. And I'll tell you something interesting while I was researching the book, there's a number of uh, different academic centers and, and archives around the US where veterans letters or veteran stories or unpublished papers or diaries are stored. And so naturally, if you're working on this kind of project, you wanna contact all these folks and say, do you know of anybody with this kind of background? Do you have any stories or any letters from anybody at the 84th Infantry, which is the infantry is fighting in, in Europe, and uh, uh, one one archive wrote back and said, yeah, in fact, uh, we've got an interview with your father that he did about 20 years ago for somebody else's project. So we've got your dad's original words here, along with your discussion, more recent discussion of your dad, and then combine that with other independent historical basis, and you get an interesting story. This story takes place after the Battle of Bulge, where Carl's unit is deep in Germany. And the war, this is April, 1945. As we know, the, the Germany surrenders in May. So the war is essentially over. And, and you can tell it. You can tell it by the pace of activity. You can tell it by the number of Germans surrendering. You can tell it by the ages of the Germans surrendering. You can tell it by the lack of military profession, that these guys are not professional soldiers, but it's the local butcher, baker, candlestick maker who's being thrown into the battle. It's local teenagers are being thrown in. So you can tell that Germany is burning through its capacity to fight very quickly. And uh, the people who are surrendering are very glad to surrender, very glad to get out of the fight. So there's no more will to fight left at this point. Uh, but what this means to the GIs is caution and planning and steady progress. So everybody knows they just have to stay on target for these final weeks, but the end is near as they're advancing in Germany. Nonetheless, Carl's captain calls a meeting of the company, company being about 150 or so GIs, telling them that he has volunteered them for a mission. The men are to take a village of Gartau from resisting German soldiers who had successfully repelled a different American company the previous day. Now there's no enthusiasm this laid in the door for heroics or for any kind of direct attack of this nature. But the order had come down and the next day, Carl and the entire company are sent to take this village, which was only about a mile away from the position where they were bivouacking. So they had to move a mile to get to the front. The plan was to base the entire attack on surprise and use a running frontal assault on enemy position. This is typically in military science viewed as not a wise move because you're giving the enemy full visibility. But the logic of that moment was it's going to be a surprise and we're going to do this at dawn. So we'll be there. Uh, we'll cover a few hundred yards very quickly and we'll be there very quickly. So we'll be OK. And as the troops, it kind of works, it kind of works initially because the troops do cover the ground to the village and they get to a barbed wire fence. And the barbed wire fence is affixed to metal poles. And, and the men can use the poles to hop over. And Carl gets to the fence and he puts his bar down on the other side of the fence of the wiring and ready to hop over. And the moment he puts his weapon down on the side of the fence, all hell breaks loose. 
because the American crossing of the field wasn't successful uh, because of surprise or because it was early dawn or because they were fast runners. The American assault across the field was successful because the Germans wanted them to be successful. The Germans had been watching the GIs advance all along. They had previously ranged all their weapons to the fence, knowing that the GIs would have to congregate at that fence. So let them come into your range of fire, let them come where you can get them, and then you can unleash everything you've got. Rifle fire, machine gun fire, mortar fire, all on the fence. And it's a, it's a perfect group of targets. So there's enormous amount of activity at that fence, enormous amount of casualties on the US side. Uh, Carl hits the ground. He had just placed his weapon across the fence, so he's weaponless, he's on the wrong side of the fence. It seems like the entire company is shooting back, except people already killed, injured, or on the ground. Uh, he knows he knows the Germanies can recognize the bar. German snipers are told you try to hit the company commander, you hit the officer, you try to hit the radio man, and you try to hit the bar man, right? Because those are the most dangerous people in any company. So you're marked as, as a sniper target for the Germans. Uh, so he's he's just paralyzed on the ground. Luckily, within a few minutes, the fighting starts to shift to one side of the field, as can happen, and Carl's able to clear the fence and grab his gun and follow the momentum of the action. So it's the fighting is moving to the left side of the village. So Carl's doing what everybody's doing. You run, you hit the ground, you run, you hit the ground, you run, you hit the ground, so you're not allowing anybody to get a bead on you, uh, and you have to keep doing this every few seconds. Uh, but, but as he moves to the left, he could see GIs seeking cover in a drainage ditch, half filled with April icy water. Carl's able to get to that ditch as well. And he had about a half dozen other GIs from his company in that ditch. They're up to their waist in water, but at least they're allowed, they could keep their heads up and take in the situation. They could see very quickly that the Germans were fighting from foxholes and trenches uh, around the village. The GIs realized they could follow the ditch into town and get behind the German line. So that's what they do. They get, they keep wading through that ditch, wading through the water, get into town. There's a sergeant there points him to a farmhouse. Carl's able to get on the second floor at that farmhouse. Now here's Carl's discussion from his interview a few decades back. I was at the second story window. I saw a German trying to cross an open field running in the direction of where the main action was. I took a quick shot at him while he was running to try to slow him down. It works because he hits the ground on a plain open field. Well, I thought that was pretty dumb that he just lies there and he doesn't move. Then I, I tried to decide what to do. Well, he's mine and I could have him if I wanted. I decided I would kill him. He's not surrendering. I didn't want to kill him. Do I really want to take a human life after having a shot at him? And he's just, lying there well i decided well this is a, a hell of a time to start to become a conscientious objector i, I decided yes I, I would kill him i uh, i'm ashamed to admit the final reason that this would be an opportunity to have the experience of positively killing someone knowing that i killed i wouldn't have to wonder anymore what it felt like so i did it i just shot him he never moved i had a queasy experience about it ever since it's the only absolute time i ever positively knew i killed someone we had a patrol going out the next day and we went right by the guy I killed. He never moved a muscle, head down. I picked up his head and felt the, the brains and gore. What it really meant, the position of the head, the position of the body, was that my very first quick shot where I tried to slow him down had actually hit him in the head. I know it had to have been my first shot because he never moved when he hit the ground. So all the time I was trying to decide, should I take this life or shouldn't I? In fact, I'd already taken his life. This has struck with me strongly ever since. The Germans hadn't thought about that flaky community and they took quite a few casualties from those foxholes. After about 20 minutes, the remaining Germans decided to surrender. They were just taking too many uh, casualties. This was Carl's final moment of combat. This final quote, bloody and pointless, stupid Germans for not surrendering stupid captain for ordering the assault. So Carl fights all the way until Germans 
Germany surrender in May, and then he's with occupation for the rest of the year, moved to different towns, different kind of occupation duty, uh, different kind of work, obviously. And he rotates back to the U.S. in January 1946. He's mustered out. And Carl's able to return to Miami in the fall of 47 and to graduate in 1948. And the rest, the rest of his story is pretty typical. He used the GI Bill to pay for tuition. He joined the family business back in Canton. If you're from Ohio, you might know uh, Sugardale Provision Company is a meatpacking company, I think best known for dollar dog days uh, when the Indians played. Uh, he met his wife, Audrey, on a blind date. They went married and went on and had four kids, of which I am the third. And Miami was always a very important part of dad's life. I think it did do what it was supposed to do. It did elevate him. It did shape him. It did sharpen him. It did provide some structure and a little bit of discipline. And it did so in an environment that's congenial, that that is welcoming and supportive. So you get all of this benefit of higher education, but you get it done in a fashion that you largely can absorb and appreciate. And it's a it's fundamentally a pleasant experience. So that that is the the Carl Avin story. I think we've got a few uh, graphics, Emily, that uh, we want to show that are part of the, the book message. This, just a few things to, to go through here. This is uh, Carl and his one brother, Fred. So Carl's in the middle, the younger person, their mother, my grandmother, Dorothy, uh, a family photograph, uh, 1930s. Uh, I, I don't know what ages you would you would guess there, but my guess, Fred is two years older than Carl. So my guess is Carl's eight or 10 and Fred is 12 or 14. And uh, you've got a nice soft focus lens. And I think consistent with the very staged uh, family photographs of that era, I'm not aware of many, many moms who say, hey kids, I'm gonna read you a little bit before you go to bed. So make sure you put on your neckties. So it doesn't, doesn't look like a casual family snapshot to uh, although it looks more like a job interview to my mind but in any event it captures them in the during the great depression uh next photo please this is from the miami student after pearl harbor uh and i think it captures uh the moment um that you have on the right hand side the current student who's in a zoot suit the the sort of the trendy uh, dressed up outfit of the day. Uh, you know, we, we, we would call somebody dressed like that today, we might call them more of a, a party animal or a dandy, uh, or, or as they say here, Joe College, and he's looking at himself, right? Uh, and it's that daunting sense of mission and daunting sense of duty that he's facing. The other interesting aspect of this cartoon, I think it's very well done. The other interesting aspect is when we look at the GI, how much of a World War I GI this is. I mean, again, the US military, even right after Pearl Harbor is still defined by World War I. It hasn't yet got up to speed for World War II. They still have the World War I helmet. They still have World War I leggings. So the person is uh, looking at the future, but he's doing so through a vision of the past. Uh, next, please. This is uh, Carl, uh, right after basic training, right after Fort Hood, uh, colorized uh, black and white photo, uh, courtesy of the US Army. And it says from your TD son, tank destroyer son, and he's got his tank destroyer patch on, but he never actively served with the tank destroyers. I said he went into infantry, went into, uh, they, they moved him from armor to, uh, to infantry. Uh, next, please. This is a little harder to see. I don't know, Emily, if you're able to enlarge that, but this is the this is the march of the 84th Division across Germany, and they go from the Belgian border across the Rhine, across the Ruhr, all the way to the Elbe, and the Elbe is where we demarcated the American zone of occupation from the uh, Russian zone of occupation, and Karl says they were actually on the Elbe for several weeks because the Americans got to the Elbe before the Russians got there. And it said the astonishing, uh, uh, the astonishing news for him on the Elbe was you had thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of German soldiers of Wehrmacht 
on the Russian side of the river, but all of them desperate to get to the American side, knowing full well they're much likely to be receiving better treatment uh, from the Americans than they're ever going to get from the Soviets. So you had you know a few rowboats going back and forth. You had some people trying to swim uh, the Elbe. You had uh, people in uh, uh, clearly Nazi high command with swastika armbands pushing their way to the front, pushing Wehrmacht soldiers out of boats so they could take the boat. Uh, and you had this go on for several weeks and Americans, of course, receiving any GIs who uh, surrendered uh, to them to get to the camps. Uh, next, please. This is the city of Hanover, uh, which we Americans know historically as the home city of the German monarch, of the, of the British monarchy. I mean, this is where George I was, uh, was born and where George III uh, from the American Revolution, where, his, where he, he was not born there, but that's his grandparents. But this just shows the extraordinary destruction of the American air effort at this point. You're, you're past the Battle of Bulger into March and April, where America dominates the skies. It can just rain uh, destruction on these cities. So extraordinary amount of uh, damage being done. One, one interesting uh, development of Hanover, which is again captured in the book, is that, look, this is a large, modern, prosperous city before the air raid start, before the war comes. Uh, and the German soldiers pull out of Hanover, but they instruct their sort of home guard, the Hanover citizens, you have to fight to the end. We're leaving, we're leaving to our next line of defense, but you guys keep fighting. Well, of course, any normal human being can figure out what's going on if the army's withdrawing and you're supposed to fight to the end. If any normal human being would say, well, you've got to be nuts. Uh, and so indeed, we put out white sheets to surrender. Well, the army had pulled out, but the Gestapo was still there. So the Gestapo could go house to house to anybody put a white sheet and pull these guys out for uh, treason and shoot them. So you had a very dangerous game being played that nobody left in Hanover. None of the civilians really had an appetite to fight, but they couldn't surrender or move because they're being told by their Nazi masters that they had to keep the, the war going. So it's a calamity for the civilians there. And I think that's the last image that we have. Is that right, Emily? Yeah, thank you. So uh, Molly, should we go to questions or what's the, what's the best use of our time? Absolutely, we can take some questions now. Thank you so much, Frank. That was, it always is just, I mean, I've watched my fair share of Band of Brothers probably six or seven times all the way through. And these stories just never get any less. I just cannot imagine being yeah. practically a boy and, yeah. you know, sort of facing facing down that experience. Do you know, did he did he talk very much about his pre-war experience i mean you know sort of looking down the barrel of getting ready to go and you know how was that tempered by his experience at miami i'm sure that having some yeah. focus prior right. to of well there's an extraordinary evolution i would say because when when uh, pearl harbor uh takes place there's this extraordinary surge of patriotism and excitement and we're going to go get them and it's almost a, a this sort of youthful uh energy that comes forward and that lasts a good year or so i think until casualties start coming in and then there's a lot of dutifulness to say look we've got our mission we've got our mission in front of us um uh, but we're gonna get we're gonna see through it but the final six months the final six months of combat there's almost fatalism and in fact i've got this interesting quote from the book about how fatalism takes hold in your mind. And he says the first, the first uh, thought of every GI in combat is a lot of folks getting killed around here, but it won't happen to me. It won't happen to me because I'm basically, you know, good and smart and doing the right thing. So I'm okay. And I'm, a, I'm an American teenager, so I'm bulletproof, right? That's your first, your first thought. Your second thought is, uh, 
you know what, uh, this is actually pretty dangerous. And it's happening to all sorts of people who are as good and smart as I am. But if I play by the rules and remember my training and I'm thoughtful, intelligent about this, I'm going to get through this. OK, so if I if I'm uh, play the game the right way, I can still get through it. That's the second phase. And the third phase, the fatalist phase is no one's getting out of here. No one is getting out of here. The casualty rates are just so horrific, so bad. There is not a chance you're going to get out of here. I got to tell you something. When I was uh, at the Library of Congress doing research on this unit, and you're going through the archives, and this company, this company L, and again, the company is 100, 150 people, the company had over 100% casualties by, by arithmetically. I'm just looking at the numbers of, of people in the company and the, the number of cat. You say, what's well, it was like 150% casualties, 180% casualties. And I had to call the archivist over and I said, look, am I doing the math wrong? How is this? This is not mathematically possible. How can you have 100 people in your company have 180 people killed, right? This is, I'm, I'm reading this wrong or something's wrong. I said, no, no, you're reading it right. Here's what this means. This means that uh, people in the unit are killed and their replacement is killed and their replacement is killed. So even though the unit full strength is only 100 to 150 people, it took two to 300 casualties out of that unit. So you were arithmetically going to be killed. So Carl, my dad told me, he joins this unit Christmas day, uh, 1944. He says within 30 days, he is in the top half of seniority of his unit. So that's when you move very quickly. So there's three phases of sort of denial and acceptance to say, you know, this is going to be nothing but bad news. This is nothing but bad news. And I've been pretty darn lucky that I got through so far, but it's going to come to me. So it's a it's incredible fatalism. This is why when I mentioned that final story about that attack on Gartau and you're the young captain come and say, hey guys, I've got some good news. We're going to make a frontal assault. Everybody says, look, it's over. It's over. If we're just smart about this thing, we don't have to fight anymore. We don't have to kill anybody. Nobody's going to kill us. So let's just be smart about this. Um, something my dad said when he left the Army, he said, you know what? If I never have another lucky day as long as I live, I will die a lucky man because of all the luck I had over this previous time in the Army. Right? So... Like, yeah. Wow, you know, and I, I was thinking about that that sweet, boyish, endearing letter he wrote to your to your grandmother. Yeah. You know, please send fudge and some some other yeah. things. And here are my grades. And you yeah. know, it just is. It's just really extraordinary how right. they took themselves from that place in life as a boy and and. Yeah marched overseas and you know ultimately arrived at what you explain you know is this you know very fatalistic nobody's yeah. getting out of here and when you think about it in the context of um you know 180 you know how many times over really you know they saw casualties in their their one unit my goodness that's just it's just amazing to me. Yeah, also, what I took out of that first letter, Molly, the one I just read, was I think in a lot of ways this is a normal you know, start to Miami or normal start to college, meaning you're just so darn proud to be there. You're just so excited about being there. You have, for the first time in your life, you have autonomy. Yes. Obviously, as you're a teenager going through high school, the leash you're on is a little longer and longer each time. And, you know, you're, you're sort of setting your own pace even as a high school student, but you're living at home and you're living under their scrutiny and you're playing by their rules, you know, even if it's basically a, a loving family and so forth, you're, you're just dying to get the heck out of there. You're dying to get out of there. So what I took out of that letter was, uh, and he even says this explicitly in a later letter, uh, he says something to the effects of mom, you always used to tell me I, I, I wasn't studying hard enough, or I wasn't working hard enough, but now that I'm you know, you're not telling me this, I'm even getting better grades. Now that I'm like not, now that I'm self-directed, I'm autonomous, I'm actually outperforming. So he's sort of, he's sort of twisting her tail a little. And then there's even, there's even a later letter where he really goes over the line, which I just couldn't believe that any, there's gotta be some story there, but he tells, he sort of writes these, you know, this letter, these letters are email, right? There's no email, there's no, you can't even make a phone calls because it's a long distance call. So you're just, everything's in writing and everything's back and forth, and you'll write a few letters uh, a week, perhaps, just say, here's what's going on. 
But he said, uh, he says to his mom just in passing, you know, sort of, P.S., I got drunk this weekend. Uh, yeah, I said, well, I don't think there's a kid in America who would ever say that. So, but, but, but he said, I didn't like it and I don't think I'll do it again or something. So who knows, who knows, but uh, what he's trying to do. But I said, the only thing he's trying to do is twist her tail. The only thing he's trying to do is give her sort of a little slap on the cheek there, right? But uh, uh, so, so be it. Uh, <laughs> That's actually really cute. I I, I want to think he, he really earned that cocktail. He enjoyed yeah. that yeah. day and subsequently wrote home about. So we have a couple questions sure. about how your dad ended up at Miami, coming all yeah. the way from Canton. Yeah. Um, how did he end up there? I know his older brother um, yeah. went. I, and I, I, I can only give you a partial answer to that. By the way, he loved Miami. He, he had, a, I think, a very positive experience there. And it really, I, I think in shorthand, you'd say you get your game up. It forces you to perform and it elevates you and it exposes you to some really bright folks and professors and, and to sort of a world off opportunity. So, uh, so it was a very positive experience for him. But his parents told him, if you want to go to college, uh, we have two requirements. It must be an Ohio school. Uh, and secondly, you must major in business. So, so <laughs> well, you could tell the parents are only somewhat, somewhat buying into this whole idea of college, right? But they said, all right, if you're going to do it, this is how you're going to do it. So the running joke, which maybe has some truth to it, but the running joke is Miami is the school in Ohio that is as far away from home as possible. That you can go to that might that might have been it but as we mentioned he was sort of faded or destined because of his older brother two years older and older brother fred by the way two years older and is that much further along so he's he's in a naval officer's training program and he's sent to the pacific so the parents the parents only have two children two boys one's with the navy in the pacific one's with the army in europe so but but i'll tell you the whole country was that way the whole country every any single kid of uh, uh, of military age was in the military. And remember, the, the rules changed on siblings in combat only after the Indianapolis. We had this terrible, the five Sullivan brothers on in the Indianapolis very late in the war. The Indianapolis gets sunk. All five brothers are killed because they're all serving on the same ship. So it's just a disaster. And only at that point does the War Department say, look, we can't have we can't have siblings in combat together. It's too cruel to the parents, right? But that's that's that doesn't affect these guys are very far gone by the time that that uh, rule comes into place. So Carl's brother, he he made it home safely. He too. Oh, yeah, both brothers came home. Both brothers came home. Very very lucky. Very. Lucky. Uh, I don't know if Fred had to go. Uh, Carl had to go back to Miami. He had finished one year in Miami, then he got another year of credit, so he added two more years. Uh, to finish Miami. I don't know if Fred had to finish because he had had three years in Miami. And if that was, they, they waived stuff or gave him other credit for training and so forth, or, or if he came back for a semester. So did your dad choose his branch of service? I know his brother went to the Navy. Uh, your dad ended up in the Army. There's some very funny letters between my dad and his father about, and by the way, his father was in the U.S. Army in World War One, but only served stateside. But at least had some some orientation or understanding about Army life. But they're very funny letters about where do you think I should serve, or what do you think I should do, and which is the most promising. All of the normal kind of questions. I'm saying it's funny because the need for the Army was overwhelmingly uh, infantry. That's where people are getting ground up. That's where you need people. And so you might have some great ideas that you want to be. Uh, a, a, a pilot or you want to be a meteorologist, he says in one letter, or wants to do something else, but say, forget it, buddy, you're going to get, uh, you're going into the army. And the reason he uh, was a barman was not because he was a expert marksman or a good shot. It's because he was six foot one and they gave you the tallest guy in the squad got to carry the heaviest gun. So they, so they just said, you're the tall fellow. So this is, this is for you. So it was it was a little bit heavier than the M1 carbine that everybody else carried, and he had your special ammunition and uh, ammo vest and so forth. So he ended up with 20 extra pounds of gear. He was he did place into this college program, which lasted about a year, from finishing basic training 
the Army ran a program called ASTP, Army Specialized Training Program, which was to put kids with deemed higher aptitude into college courses so you'd have a regular college dream. So very odd given the, he's taken out of college to enlist and then he's put into a different college through the Army, because uh, but that's the way it worked. But that only lasted about a year because there was just need for more uh, regular troops. So, so he was in this college program at Queens College, New York for about a year, which he really liked. That's kind of the best. That's a glorious moment because you're in uniform, but you're just taking courses in New York City and it's a lot of fun, but it doesn't even last a year. And then he's back in Camp Shelby, Mississippi, and he's a barman. This is what we need. And this is what you're doing. So, so, uh, and then they're sent to Europe and that's that. So, uh, but, but, but the short answer is no, he really had no particular choice uh, over what he was going to do. I see. Well, you know, it doesn't sound like they all had too much choice about what they I were doing. So. I think if you were far enough in the college pipeline, as Brother Fred was, you could be deemed an officer, go to officer's candidate school. But obviously, finishing one year, they said, that's it, pal. You're too young, too junior. You're, in, you're going into the infantry. And the infantry needs the people, right? So that's that. And I think I mentioned before, Miami had this enlisted reserve corps. So Miami had an army set up on campus and there was a naval officer set up on campus, but army for the enlisted is my impression and navy for the officer. So you could go into the Navy if you're a little bit older and you have the right aptitude because it only officers training out of Miami, right? But you generally, generally you did not have a choice. So you you talk about him coming back home what was his experience coming back to miami i would imagine you you come back a very much changed individual from from something like that what was his experience like coming back to campus did he well, i would imagine there was some camaraderie with some other gis who there also is. returned. yeah you're exactly right molly i think what you see is almost like a class difference not socioeconomic class but were you are you a return veteran or are you a newbie and the return veterans all have this common experience shared experience common frame of reference and a bit of gallows humor a bit of sardonic view i think of campus life and the newbies are where carl avin was in that first letter to say isn't this the greatest time of my life i'm off at campus my mom's not watching me i'm going to meet some girls so it's a very different world uh, between those two groups of people so your affinity group is your your peers uh, and and you're you're in a different part of campus, a different place in campus. I would imagine that was probably a really good thing for for those men to you know be on a totally different page, but still have one another to you know have those shared experiences with, and and to be able to recount with somebody who really was knowing about it. I think you're absolutely right. And I think it'd be a little bit unrealistic to ask somebody who'd gone through that to say, you're going to now fit in with, you know, freshman Spanish or something. And, and a bunch of folks who are five years younger than you and had just a different attitude of life. And uh, in fact, he said that second experience, what he wanted to do was get out. What he wanted to do was get out. He was ready for life, ready to live, ready to, get married, ready to start a family. I mean, he wanted to get out at that point. Right. So uh, you, you, you've sort of done it. You've done it and you want to move ahead. So Yeah, and certainly by that time, he's done a whole lot more than your average college student has. Yeah. It's a whole lot of life experience sort of jammed yeah. into. Right. Yeah, it's a different world. Different yeah, world. Right. it really is, which makes it ever more fascinating. Yeah. Um, so did your dad choose to stay in touch with um, other soldiers in his company, you know, you hear about that band of brothers thing. Was that? Uh, more so with Miami colleagues than people in his company. That was my uh, next question, actually. Yeah. And remember, there's no email, there's no Facebook, people move. And if I may say, if I make a generalization, I think men are, are, are weaker than women at being correspondents and maintaining. And everybody says, see you around. And you say, what well, we gonna see you around. He had one uh, very good friend in Indiana. He did maintain touch with Indiana. It was close enough. They actually could go visit during the summers and so forth. Um, but uh, but most people in the company did not stay in touch with. And he also, you know, there's sort of a, uh, I think, a psychological evolution of people's attitude, meaning you might have a lot of respect or even friendships for your colleagues, but but 
at the same time, he did not want to define his life in retrospect. He did not want to define his life by what he did in World War II. And, and so he, he did not join any veterans organizations. He did not want to take a sort of celebration, a celebratory attitude toward combat. And he didn't want that to be the central element of his life. Uh, so, uh, you know, not may, I, I think a reasonable decision, right? You're, you're proud of what you had to do, but life is more than just that. So, uh, and I think it also had to do with the pre, today, I think sociologists and other friends will say, look, you should talk about it. I think if you go back a generation two, it was turn it off, repress it, don't talk about it, get on with your life. The best way is to get it behind you and, and start a family and get on with business and uh, it's, it's your past. And that was, I think, pretty much his approach. He never, by the way, he never, th this book is full of a lot of anecdotes and reminiscences and weird moments. And none of these were ever shared with us as children. Uh, and indeed he would typically, you know, if you go back to the 1960s, these World War II movies were at their high point, the TV shows were their high point. Uh, he would leave the room. He said, I've got no particular interest in watching a Hollywood depiction of what I did. Uh, that that old joke when the, the very well-received movie, The Longest Day, the book, The Longest Day about D-Day came out and uh, the movie came out and the guys asked, hey, have you seen the movie? And the fellow responded, I, I saw the play. Yeah. So, yeah. so as the yeah. point is, they, did, they had no, no desire to spend time with that part of his life. So the point is it was only quite late in the day. And interestingly, because you mentioned this, Molly, I had seen Band of Brothers and I said, look, I know my dad did things like that, uh, had bridged that, but I don't, I don't know what unit he was in. I don't know where he trained. I don't know what his specialty is. I don't know who his commanding officer is. And I want to just get a tape recorder and I want to just interview him. And I just want to understand where did you serve? What was your unit? So he consented to that. And I ended up with a 20 or 30 page sort of memoirs. It was really at that time, just sort of a memo for family members saying, here's just a summary of talking to dad, what he told us. Then we literally found in the in the furnace room the box, the proverbial box of letters. His mother had saved all of the letters he wrote from Miami through basic training through war. And a lot of these are censored or can't give you full details, but but they were very important for me to go back to him and say, hey, you sent this letter here and it's very uh, confusing what, what you mean in this letter. And he said, oh, well, let me tell you what that means. So it sparked his memory and it allowed for a conversation. And then you go to archival material, you go to all of these great history centers around the country uh, to, to get the formal, uh, the formal history of the unit and the geographical location and other people's memoirs are very important in this process as well. Uh, so then you end up with a decent uh, history book full of all sorts of colors. Well, yeah, what a wonderful thing that you have this narrative from him. You know, there are so many folks who really never share, you know, such valuable yeah. parts of their life. And, you know, they they pass on and, and nobody knows these things. And then there's I, no one to ask. And I, I, I would tell anybody on this phone, you've got elderly relatives, get that tape recorder and just, just go through some baseline questions with them. And it could be World War II, it could be Korea War, or so, it could be anything in peacetime, but they've got their life experiences. And just to get down, you know, where were you born and where did you go to grade school? And what was your favorite class in high school? And just to start getting, filling in these blanks is uh, just a terrific journey for them and for you. So. Absolutely, I 100% agree. What a gift that was that, that you had the foresight to do that. I, I think that's really, really fantastic. Um, let's see, we are getting low on time. I do want to squeak in just a couple more questions and a reminder okay. to our viewers, okay. if you have to leave us before we've concluded, we will have a, um, a taped version, I'm dating myself with taped, um, on our websites later this afternoon, recorded version, if you will. Um, and so let's see, just this one, one last question. Um, this comes from Dan. He says, my father was a University of Dayton student who joined the Marines in 1942. Great. At the time of his invasion of Okinawa, Okinawa, rather, he was 25 years old. In my research, I discovered that college students and other individuals uh, were a minority 
in the military? Did your father experience something similar like that? Did he? Yeah, yeah, he did. He did say that there were, uh, you know, he's in this program at Queens College, New York, this ASTP program, which is 100 percent college. And then it's really uh, uh, quite a shift to go back to infantry, just to go back to the ground troops uh, in the 69th Division. And he mentioned that, that the that the levels of education varied considerably, uh, the uh, aspirations and worldviews of people varied considerably, and, and it can sometimes be a challenge, uh, you know, in, in that kind of social milieu. Although we had a very interesting discussion at this point, I mean, there's a real positive element here. He said, you know what, uh, he, he came from a very kind of comfortable middle class background. It was the Great Depression, so it's not as affluent as we are today, but he came from a comfortable background. And then uh, and then he's thrown into this different world. And he said, you know what, I, I had to spend a few years of my life, so to speak, being at the bottom of the barrel. And I never forgot what life is like at the bottom of the barrel. We have no friends, no support. You're entirely dependent on a system. And it's a big, sometimes unfriendly system. Uh, and you got to make friends and you got to work together to try to get through all of this this mess. And he said, I always had sympathy for folks who are at the bottom of the barrel. So he took something out of that experience uh, that there are, you know, everybody comes from a different background. And you've got to find some way to empathize and connect with people uh, who might have a more limited background than you've got. Oh, Frank, your dad sounds like he was a really great guy. He just sounds so endearing and so smart and it, given the way you tell about his experience, perhaps um, leaps and bounds beyond his chronological age um, in his mind. So what a fascinating story. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I did wanna just read a comment really fast. She says, not a question, but rather a comment. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing your dad's amazing story as a Canton native myself and Miami alumna and the daughter of a World War II veteran. I very much enjoyed your presentation today. Um, so I would assure you that she's probably not the only one who has such close near and dear ties. Molly, if it's okay with you, I'll close with a quote myself. Uh, uh, this, this is from uh, Occupation, remember from May, 45 to Jan 46, Carl's in the U.S. forces that are occupied Germany. And so you've got base camp, you know, you've got sports, you've got the football team and uh, a baseball team, and you also got a base library. And Carl's a big reader. And he, he reads a book, which is still in print today, but which had a huge, huge following in, on college campuses and in general population, Will Durant's story of philosophy, where he introduces you to one chapter on each of the major Western philosophers uh, and Carl writes uh, to his mama, you know, the, the person who spoke to me uh, about this moment the most uh, fittingly was Spinoza. And he said, that's interesting. I, I personally don't know anything about Spinoza, uh, but let's go to Will Durant's story of philosophy and read what Spinoza has to say. And you read it against the backdrop of Nazi Germany. Here's Spinoza's political philosophy. This is the final quote. Law is necessary because men are subject to passions. If all men were reasonable, law would be superfluous. Uh, the last end of the state is not to dominate men, nor to restrain them by fear. Rather, it is to free each man from fear, that he may live and act with full security and without injury to himself or his neighbor. The end of the state is not to make rational beings into brute beasts and machines. It is to enable their bodies and their minds to function safely, it is to lead men to live by and to exercise free reason, that they may not waste their strength and hatred, anger, and guile, nor act unfairly toward one another. Thus, the need of the state is really liberty. So you can see, I mean, I think that resonates with us today, that you can see if you were standing in that wreckage of Hanover and seeing the incredible destruction of Nazism and, and the calamity of World War II, how Spinoza would speak to a uh, Carl Lavin then and how he still resonates with us today. And I'll tell you this, if Carl Lavin had not gone to Miami, he would not be the kind of guy who picks Will Durant's book off the bookshelf as a, let me just flip through this and see what the great minds uh, of Western civilization have to share with us. So it's a great journey for him. 
Uh, it's, I think, a point of pride of the school that produces people like that. And thank you, Molly, for hosting me today. And I have to say in absentia, thank you to everybody in the audience for being great listeners and good hosts. Uh, and if you want more of the story, the, the book is on Amazon and we'd be delighted to uh, have you partake. Well, thank you so much. Those are brilliant parting words. Um, I do have one last question. Okay. Um, someone asked if you would be willing to um, engage in a follow-up conversation, perhaps via email. I know that you have a website out there, um, but there is some uh, specific interest in engaging with you uh, post this webinar. Sure, let me, I'll be very happy to connect with people. It's really one of the real joys of these talks is you run into people like the letter you wrote read earlier that somebody's from Canton or somebody knows my dad from Miami or somebody serving you. So it's a real joy. It's a lot of fun. By the way, the best way is I am on LinkedIn if you're on LinkedIn. And if you're not on LinkedIn, let me suggest you send Molly an email and she could forward it on to me. Is that okay, Molly? I'm putting that is phone absolutely phone. fine. Okay. I am more okay. than happy to do that for anyone in the audience who is interested in connecting with you. Thank you so much, Frank. This has Thanks, been Molly. really fantastic. Um, presentation. We so appreciate you taking the time to be with us and um, to share your dad's story. Um, and as a reminder, a recording, not a, a, a tape of this presentation will be available later on our website today. Thank you again to Ambassador Frank Levin for leading us in this webinar today. Uh, please check out our new and other archived webinar presentations at alumlc.org slash Miami OH. And as Frank mentioned, you can find his book, Homefront to Battlefront on Amazon or by going to HF2, the number two, bf.com. You can also purchase the book through there. Thank you so much for joining us and love and honor to you all. Have a great day. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you.